Dr. Rob, what do you think the biggest misconception is about placing implants or implants in general? I think the biggest misconception about placing implants is that dental implants are a commodity. And uh, I talk about implant design a lot, and implants are not a commodity. And what, when we say a commodity, what we mean is um, water is water is water. You know, like it, it, it used to be that water was all a commodity. And then we have people like Avion and Fuji that come along and they, they make it not a commodity anymore. Now you're paying a premium for the water, okay? But dental implants are not all made the same. And I think the biggest misnomer is that all implants are all implants work. Uh, we hear people say this all the time, all implants work. And then I follow that up with that is absolutely true to level, different leveling degrees of success. <laughs> so yeah, they all work, but some fail quicker than others, you know, and some have more complications than others. So the, the, at the end of the day, probably the biggest thing that I see is dental implants are not all made the same. And, and if you just start with the most primitive, simple, you know, topic, if you just talked about material itself, you would say, well, they're all made out of titanium, right? And yeah, most of them are made out of titanium. So if we just stay in the titanium family, there's different grades of titanium. And many of the implants are made with a softer metal and a grade four titanium rather than the grade 23 uh, medical grade titanium alloy. And so you say, well, what's the difference? So the difference is nearly 40% increase in strength. A 40% increase in strength, that's huge. Imagine that you've got a titanium driver and your buddy has a titanium driver and theirs can hit the ball 40% further, <laughs> right? So you drive 100 yards and they drive 140 yards. Like you'd be like, wow, I'd like to have that titanium driver, not the one I have, right? So it, it, having, having just the right material is so, so important. And the fact is, is that sometimes, uh, sometimes we press a dental implant into a solution that it's not, that it in itself is not 100% happy with. In other words, we push the envelope for the solution. Uh, for instance, you might just think of a, a cantilever, okay? So implants can tolerate cantilevers, but they don't like them at all. And so if they had their choice, if they could speak, if they could open their mouth, they had the first thing out of their mouth is like, please no cantilevers or minimize the cantilevers or, or make them low, like small, right? Because what happens is the cantilever transfers forces into bending moments. It wants to bend the implant, the abutment, the abutment screw, and the pros. And when you put those components into a bending moment, things break. Pros screws become loose. The cement delaminates between your crown and your abutment. A lot of bad things happen. The implant can even break. So if you have a weak implant and it breaks uh, in a bending moment, it can break. So now, imagine you have the same bending forces, the forces that are creating these bending moments, but you've got an implant that's 40% stronger. It may be the case that that was your get out of jail card. That was your kitchen pass to, I put a solution in, it wasn't perfect, it wasn't ideal, it was less than ideal, but because I chose the stronger implant, I still don't have a problem, okay? And in my practice, what I want is zero problems. I don't want to have any problems in my practice. I, I've got enough problems in my life. I have five kids and a wife and a, you know, a house and, you know, I got enough problems, right? You know, change the oil, right? You know, there's enough things going on in your life to keep, you, to keep you busy with problems. If you can eliminate them where you can, it just makes your life simpler and then you can focus on things that you enjoy like a good cup of coffee or a glass of wine, in my, my wife's case. So uh, reducing the complexities is really, really important. And the best way to do that is to pick a great implant. Pick an implant that reduces your risk. That's the starting point. You know, you, you start with the implant and then you build everything on top of it. So if the implant's weak, everything you build on top of it can is suspect to break. And so I, I would say that the biggest no more is to, is to hear someone say, all implants are the same, they all integrate. And I would say, no, yeah, I, I, I would say that, yeah, they can integrate, but to different levels of longevity, different levels of overall success over time. That's probably the biggest thing I see in the industry. And, and what's the difference in price between an implant made with the lower grade titanium versus the grade 23? So most of the, if you look at the big companies, the pricings are very competitive because they have to be. So if you look at like the big four, they're, they're, those, those pricings are going to be very competitive. 
What happens is, is you can actually find an implant made uh, overseas in a foreign country that you could have imported um, that is extremely inexpensive, like very inexpensive. Uh, and the reason is, is because they're just making a screw, okay? And uh, I mean, if you can go to Home Depot and you see a screw and the screw costs um, 25 cents, okay? You say, well, what's the difference between that 25 cents screw at Home Depot and the one that might cost say $300? And so the answer is, a whole lot, <laughs> a whole lot. And uh, what I mean by that is that when you go to a medical grade titanium, it, that metal costs a little bit more to make than non-medical grade. The impurities in medical grade titanium, the, the alloy, grade 23, the impurities are driven down. It's called extra low interstitial impurities. So what you, ELI, you wanna drive those impurities down so that what you put in the body is pure. You'd like for that implant to be made in a clean house. So there are implants that are made in a factory alongside the sheetrock screw that goes in your house. Uh, uh, yeah, they're, they're, <laughs> they're, they're not made in a clean house. So you're getting an implant that m may have contaminants from the factory in it. And then you put it in the mouth because it's inexpensive. So you run a significant amount of risk. And then there's quality assurance and quality control. So when you're making these things, if, they're, if, they're, if the titanium is not if it's not made right, the stock, the rod that they make at the factory to make, they take that rod and then they put it through a process to turn it into an implant. If the rod isn't made right, if it's not cooled properly, so when it's first made, it's hot, and then if it's not cooled properly over a certain temperature gradient over a certain time, you get a different result. You get different uh, uh, grains inside the metal over time. So if you've if you got somebody that's not paying attention to that because they're not going to pay for a quality assurance person, then you don't know what you're getting. It looks like an implant. It acts like an implant. You put it in the mouth, and then a year later, it breaks. And, and, and then you're like wondering why this implant broke. So there, there's just some, so many aspects that go into a good quality implant at the, at the, at the quality level. And, and there's a guy out of Europe that has a website that has um, done a lot of analysis. He'll procure implants from different companies, and then he'll look at them under a microscope, and then he'll do an analysis. And he's pretty much hated by all uh, because he's, <laughs> he's done a really good job. And so everybody's like, you know, uh, so at the high level. So the big, the big corporations um, like Strawman, uh, Bio Horizons, uh, Nobel, uh, Zimmer, those guys – you're, getting a, you're going to get a, a, a product that's going through the quality assurance solution, right? And those, those price points are almost the same. Uh, some of them are a little bit high because they have brand, they're carrying a brand recognition with them. And, and I don't believe that they're necessarily worth, <laughs> worth that. You're paying for a brand, so you got to be careful. But the, then the back, th the back side is also is that these, these companies have different pricing points for different people. And so I would encourage people to ask, you know, if you're really, really set on a particular implant, I would encourage you to, to ask the sales rep for that implant. It says, I'd really like to work with you, but um, it doesn't work for my business model because your price point is here. If we could get your price point to this point, is that something, if that's something we could do, I would prefer to use yours because yours is made out of a better material, you know, or a stronger material. And I want that factor of safety. I don't want someone calling me and saying, my implant's broke. And you hope it's the abutment screw, and it really is the implant, because <laughs> nobody wants that on their on their on their schedule for the day. You know, it's it's a it's a non-starter. Yeah, well, that's super useful information about potentially negotiating as well. Um, thanks for sharing all of that today. Appreciate your time. Absolutely. This has been another episode of Implants Made Simple. I'm Dr. Robert Stanley, Smile Engineer. Out. <laughs>